This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, and today is a given Tuesday. And we're talking about energy. Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We love to talk about energy. There's so many things happening in energy. And we have to get perspective on it. You know, on Wednesdays, we do um, energy in America. And today, we're going we're gonna to look at Canada a little bit and see the effect. See it from the Canadian point of view. And with us for this purpose, we have a Canadian right here in our studio. Ken Rogers, a 50-year friend of mine, 55-year friend of mine, who's here from Canada, who's visiting, and who can speak to oil and gas because he's been in oil and gas forever. Hi, Ken. Well, how are you today? Yeah. So tell us, what's the status of oil and gas in Western Canada, because it's an important source of those items. Well, an important piece is you can't separate Canadian oil and gas from American oil and gas. There, there's a sufficient integration that it's kind of one market, but um, Canadian oil and gas uh, varies dramatically um, relative to almost any country in the world. Canada has a, a huge amount of oil and gas that is not pumping into the market. Um, Canada has offshore oil and gas, uh, you know, north of Newfoundland, uh, uh, right where all the icebergs flow in the spring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, making it uh, one of the more dangerous. Eastern, Eastern Canada. Yeah, yeah, one of the more dangerous places to have the large oil platforms, but yeah. uh, the experience in the North Sea uh, is exactly what proved to be workable there, and, yeah. uh, and there's a Canadian company that's developed from a, from a small company into one of the world's giants, uh, Husky, uh, that is key in that whole area of Canada. Uh, the majority of oil and gas, most people think, uh, comes from Alberta, but really there are the three most western provinces are loaded with oil and gas, and the uh, oil and gas, um, has a couple of unique features. Um, uh, one is uh, what people call heavy oil and gas. Uh, some people use a derogatory term tar sands to describe one of the biggest resources is really oil sands. Uh, you know, tar is like the, you know, the tar pit in Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, as opposed to, you know, this is just sand with the oil mixed in it. Athabasca. Yeah, Did I well, get that right? That's where the tar sands are? Um, yes, or Fort McMurray, if you watch uh, the, the news with some of the spectacular <laughs> fires other than those in California. Burning oil. <clears throat> well, it wasn't the oil, actually. It didn't damage any of the oil facilities. It just about ruined the, the city that, uh, oh, almost 100,000 people city that had the flames totally around it, and uh, the fire crews were good enough uh, you know, you tend to see lots of spectacular things on the news on how good these crews are, but that was one of the showcases for the world to see the... That they can put it out. Oh, uh, yeah, and ridiculous uh, yeah. scale of fire and heat, like the more recent stuff in California. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> anyhow, that heavy oil um, is one of the um, most interesting things about oil and gas is because... Um, uh, American interests that like to influence the rest of the world, not, you know, not the government itself, but rather the, um, what I'd like to call the American plutocrats, create these, um, uh, you know, phony public interest groups and have... Active, activists, but they're fake activists, is that it? Yes, you know, and they pay the Canadian, uh, you know, Indians or, or the... Uh, you know, we tend to use more polite terms than that, usually in Canada, but the, uh, uh, they, in effect, pay them to object to having any pipelines whatsoever that go to the West Coast to ship any of the oil sands why, stuff. Why would these big plutocratic inter interests do that? Because they own the refineries that can process it. They want to and stay, stay the, at the refineries. Well, the biggest refinery is in Minneapolis, you know, um, and uh, then the rest are on the Gulf Coast. But the that um, 
heavier oil, uh, takes slightly, you know, considerably different processing, but, you know, you do very little to it chemically, and it's then the same as every other mm -hmm. bit of oil. Mm -hmm. It works for your gasoline or for petrochemicals, etc. But the other area for which there are uh, refineries are on the Gulf Coast, and they're all owned by the same group of, of American billionaires and um, the ones that are paying for the, uh, the phony show-and-tell arguments about you shouldn't have a pipeline that could send this oil anywhere except us. Interesting. So where does that fit with um, Keystone? Oh, well, Keystone just feeds the refineries on the coast because this, uh, the oil sands probably has the one play has as much oil as all the U.S. has. Wow. I mean, it's just absolutely humongous. It's, yeah. it's like Saudi Arabia scale, but it's not like when you say Athabasca, but it's an area that's probably um, oh, bigger than New Jersey. <laughs> and it's all oil, oil sand. Yes. Well, and tar, tar, whatever. It's not, not tar, it's actually oil mixed with sand, and the difference is how deep it is. Now, the first, uh, uh, well, a huge portion of it you can mine simply with open pit, dig it up with a big shovel, stick it on a truck, take it over to a conveyor boat uh, belt, uh, roll it into a, a huge uh, plant that simply separates the sand from the oil. How do you then, do that, I mean, chemically? Uh, oh, it's it's really just a bit of heat, you know, and, and so you don't, um, you heat it enough to melt the oil, but not to cause any fumes to come off. So you're melting it out of the sand? Yeah. And it's it's lighter or heavier than the sand? Um, it's heavier. Mm, so then you can just drop it at the bottom. Yeah, because if you're dealing with oil sands that's uh, that's deeper deeper than you could do with open pit mining, um, they have a process they call it SAG D. Um, you know where it really is pumping hot water into the ground in a pipe and causing it to separate from the sand there and then gathering it below that level where mm. you've melted it in a, in a pipe the same way you would gather from a normal oil well. So you're processing it there, and that part of SAG D, you're processing it in the ground. Yes, well, some, the, it's probably one of the leading areas in the world for research, um, and all of the companies, oddly, have worked well together. You know, the world giants, um, like Shell Oil and Exxon, and they're all there in some form or another. Now, a lot of them have reduced their positions in the oil sands because of the inability to get pipelines to the West Coast. Be because um, of the, the political resistance to that. Uh, well, it's not political as much as it's been these phony Plutocratic. groups. Plutocratic resistance, if you will, using agents. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Um, unfair games. Okay. Um, however, it uh, is there, but I think that the the research that's there is making it um, uh, a much better environmental type of um, scenario than it has been historically, and I think uh, Canada generally is is far more environmentally conscious in all of our rules are far stricter than the U.S. Mm, like, interesting. Like, like the one that I find uh, most interesting has to do with fracking, or this is where they... Now, that's talk, now we're talking about gas for a minute, yeah? Well, no, uh, really, the you know major reason that the U.S. is more energy self-sufficient or oil self-sufficient is because of what's called shale oil uh, or tight oil, uh, The and this is where... Uh, in order to get the oil out, you need to uh, pump down the well a bunch of uh, sand and chemicals to basically break the rock mm -hmm. deep underground. Uh, and that, uh, that process uh, in Canada is far more restricted than the U.S. In the U.S., you can, you can have fracking, uh, you know, uh, just a few hundred yards from an elementary school. 
you know, in Canada, you, you can't get anywhere near anything that... Well, uh, that look would look at uh, what fracking has done in the state of Oklahoma, you know, with multiple seven, eight hundred uh, small earthquakes every year, because, arguably, because of fracking in Oklahoma, yeah. Well, um, I mean, depending how you measure earthquake, I mean, the whole point of any underground explosion, I mean, if you're simply doing seismic to try to determine what is the formation, you set off a minor underground explosion, and you could measure that in the surface. Would you call that an earthquake? I wouldn't. No, no but, no, but uh, you know, but my understanding is that the, in Oklahoma, homes are regularly damaged by, you know, the, the size of these small earthquakes. And uh, people, you know, have to fix their homes all the time or replace them because of this. Oh, there's a lot worse than that occurring. And a lot of it is the very difference between the Canadian and American regulations with regard to, to fracking. Um, you know, in Canada, you can't do fracking at the same shallow depth that you can do in the U.S. Mm. The, the, you have to prove... Uh, in Canada in a much more rigorous way that the fracking is not going to affect the, the local water table. The, the most jolting things on fracking are when you can see somebody turn on a water tap and click a match to it and, and the water burns. <laughs> that is jolting. <laughs> oh, uh, and that, that, those um, demos are part of why you've had resistance in places like Pennsylvania where there's um, this uh, shale gas that that's there, that they have a fear of fracking because they've seen these horror movies. If they adopted the the standard that Canada uses, uh, fracking would be no problem at all. Well, I shouldn't use no problem, but the the risks and uh, and any concerns that would arise from those risks are just so minimal mm. and and. You know, if they're not tight enough or not tough enough, you change the rules and regulations a little worse, which is, um, you know, a key piece to why the the Canadian industry is is doing well. It's but, a it's a big industry, and it includes drilling for oil as uh, in the east. Um, it includes the may I say the tar sands? Is it the wrong term? The yeah. the oil the oil, oil sands. See, being from Canada, if I called it tar sand, somebody maybe on you already. thumped me a couple <laughs> times. Okay, the oil sands <laughs> in the west. Yeah. So you've got plenty of oil, and I take it you've got plenty of gas, too. Oh, nat natural gas. Uh, Canada probably has a couple hundred years supply. Really? In, in let's take um, some formations in uh, northeast British Columbia. That's, uh, you know, if you were taking the Alaska Highway, you know, about... 300 miles before you make it to Alaska, you'd be driving through these humongous fields uh, or areas, and they're, uh, you know, much bigger in area than than the oil sands area oh, that no I mentioned. Kidding. I mean, they're the size of an average U.S. state. Um, so your market is is global. The, the you have an export market in energy, oil, and gas that goes global, and w w not quite. Tell me because well. Natural gas, um, for many places, is limited to wh where you can ship it by a pipeline. Right. Well, then you have a, a industry that's one of the more successful and growing parts of the energy industry is what's called liquid natural gas. So a country like Japan... That's LNG, isn't it? Yes, LNG. Well, we have, we, we've been talking about LNG here for a while. Oh, well, Trying you, should, be, you, here, you yeah. should be if you're interested in anything to do with energy in the U.S. or the world. Yeah. But the key places where it has an effect is somewhere like Japan, where what do you use to produce energy in Japan? And nuclear was obviously their number one pick until Fukushima. Mm. Um, well, if you're going to bring in coal you know, to burn for a power plant, or you're going to bring in oil to burn for a power plant, well, coal's cheaper. So, you know, but what do you do? Well, natural gas is an awful lot cleaner. It, it produces less um, CO2 and other, you know, ridiculous, uh, what they call GHGs, greenhouse gases, the mm -hmm. pollution, uh, the air that natural gas is far better 
And uh, so Canada has this, you know, probably more than 100 year supply for Canada in the US only if you limited it to that, but the US is a huge percentage of the world market. Mm -hmm. Well, as is, the natural gas really only goes, it's either Canada or the U.S. Yeah. And uh, because we have no liquid natural gas. Uh, now, the equivalent of Keystone Pipeline for natural gas, the natural gas distribution network is, is pretty good around the U.S. So um, where the U.S. has approved liquid natural gas plants, uh, the Canadian side has the same effort to prevent natural gas making it to the <laughs> West Coast as well. The oh, same kind of phony objections. Yeah. And part of it is, well, why not send the natural gas through the U.S. so that it can be then put into LNG at a U.S. port for on the West some, Coast, some U.S. And sell it to Asia. some U.S. billionaires uh, firm or the equivalent, like the. World's international oil companies aren't, you know, angels of the world either. Even though in Canada they're they're good citizens generally. Sure. Well, so it's a lot of revenue for sure. Uh, let, let me take a short break, Ken. There's Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman who is well skilled in oil and gas and many other businesses, important businesses in Canada, and it gives him a vantage, uh, a special observation of of how energy works. Um, and I'm going to take a short break, but before we do, I'd like, I'd like to just get one of his quotes, because he's got these great quotes. P pick one quote for us, Ken. Well, <clears throat> one I thought was, uh, was an interesting one was uh, a member of parliament said to Disraeli, that's an ancient British prime minister, sir, will e sir you will either die on the gallows or of some unspeakable disease to which Disraeli replied, that depends, sir, whether I embrace your policies or your mistress. There you go. <laughs> it's Canadian humor, but it's also British humor. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. My name is Mark Schwab. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m., Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me one o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manila. <music> Okay, we're back. We're live with Ken Rogers, a retired Canadian businessman. We're talking about oil and gas, and we're also talking about climate change, and those two things react, at least from his point of view. But before we get to that subject, I just want to get one more quote from you, Ken. What do you got? Well, with respect to uh, the American billionaires that, that do the fuddle-duddles with the American oil industry, I'd like to say they have all the virtues I dislike and none of the virtues I admire. <laughs> I borrowed that from Winston Churchill. It wasn't okay. my own my own brilliant oh, use of words. <laughs> okay, so we know that you know that Canada has huge supply of natural resources like these, and I wonder if Canada is into renewables, I mean non-fossil fuels, and I wonder if Canada thinks about climate change and you know in the larger environmental picture on the world today. Uh, and where that fits in a, in a country that is so wealthy in terms of, of fossil fuel energy. I would say Canada is far more environmentally conscious than the U.S. and far more active in doing something about it mm. than the U.S. Um, now, one of the first things that I think is important in that regard is that uh, the use of fossil fuels for energy is not simply going to go away. 
it's going to be with us for a long time. Why do you say that? Why can't we replace it with renewables? Do you call nuclear a renewable? No. Well, it sort of is. Sort of is, but there are well, historical objections, if you will. Well, if you leave out nuclear, and let's suppose you're going to say, or you make the assumption we're going to have all electric cars sometime okay, soon. Okay, let's assume that. Well, where are you going to get the power to charge up the electric car? From the utility. Well, where's the utility going to generate big the question, power? Big question. Because you simply cannot generate it from a combination of wind, solar, and geothermal. Why not? Or let's call it normal geothermal. Why not? Right now, we curtail on wind. And we have more solar during the day than we can use. And, um, you know, we have to use batteries to try to level it and, and, and sort of store it for overnight use. So if I have too much at a given time during the day, why can't I charge all the cars with the excess? Well, you can't produce enough. Okay. I mean, they, you can have these humongous solar farm, and they really produce diddly squat in energy. I mean, your hydro is a fantastic renewable. We have some of that, but actually. You have lots of it, not as much as Canada, fortunately, it's, it's not harnessed. has. It's not harnessed, but we, have, we do have some That's hydro That's right, and, and you have uh, some of the Canadian facilities, particularly, you know, in the uh, northeast area that produce uh, electricity by hydro and export it to the U.S., uh, similarly from mm -hmm. uh, right north of Minneapolis, the province called Manitoba does hydro. But waterfalls and all that. Yeah. Well, Canada's blessed with probably 25% of the world's fresh water. Right. Um, <clears throat> and lots of it goes downhill yeah. sufficiently <laughs> that, uh, that you can produce power with that mm -hmm. uh, momentum or the energy caused by the water momentum. However, um, wind farms, you know, the, you've got a a bunch of wind farms on the Big Island in particular. Well, if you ever get anywhere close to them, you know, they're awful things. They're, they're ugly, they're noisy, they kill birds, they have, like everything has a problem. But the problem gets exaggerated when you do them in, in great quantity. If you take an area, a country like Denmark, uh, which has, you know, way ahead of under the U.S. in attempts to have, um, you know, renewable energy, but really they want to have energy to avoid the problem of escalating costs mm -hmm. of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. It wasn't solely because it was environmentally wonderful. Sure. It was a combination of sure, cost sure. and and that. And, and so do we. It's energy security. You know, yeah. we don't want it jumping up when the barrel yeah. of oil jumps up. But if if you tried to propose you know, all along Santa Barbara and, and areas near Los Angeles, well, we'll have all these offshore wind farms like, like Denmark. It, you know, I'm sure the public would say, not a chance, they'd ruin all our no, beaches. That's, that's, they're, they're just ugly things. Like people here feel and, the same way. And you way. can't go boating. Yeah. Uh, you know, an awful lot of sane people would say that's just an unacceptable alternate in that scale. If you could take way up on the top of Mauna Kea or Mauna Loa, you know, Mauna Loa, you know, especially... On Mauna Kea is somewhat on problematic a, on these a side, days. Yeah, <laughs> on a side that nobody's looking at. And if you can put a bunch way up there in the wind, that's a wonderful choice. Now, you know, Canada's blessed with having, uh, uh, you know, one-tenth the population of the United States and, and roughly the same total geographical area if you count Alaska. You know, otherwise it's, you know, considerably larger than the U.S. Yeah, in yeah, area. Yeah. So we have tons of places you could put wind farms. You know, like I live in British Columbia. Well, British Columbia is full of mountains like Switzerland and Austria, but, but the size of British Columbia is more than twice the size of California. So how far advanced is wind in Canada, especially in Western Canada, especially in those mountains? Are you making great headway? Are you building a lot of wind turbines? There are a lot of wind turbines. Um, and interestingly, you have major energy companies are, one, are the ones like that are... Like oil companies. Yeah, that are the front and center leading 
you know, this, they, they have stood in their head to experiment with every alternate to fossil fuels. Yeah, and diversify. One of the reasons they keep pushing the fossil fuels is they recognize the economics uh, of the renewables. You know, they're not all that wonderful. You take away monstrous subsidies and they don't work. But, but what a lot of people miss is how subsidized the oil and gas industry is you know, in whether it's the United States or Canada or anywhere else in the world. I mean, it's one of the most ridiculously subsidized industries in the world, and it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Not anymore. Not, not when you're no. concerned about climate change. Which takes me to the whole thing about climate change. So, I mean, I, I understand that we're kind of wedded to fossil fuel, at least for a while. Um, that it's not clear that we can replace it entirely. In Hawaii, we want to replace it entirely by 2045 or earlier. Uh, we want to use solar and maybe some wind and maybe expand our geothermal capability and who knows what else. Um, it's, you know, the idea is to have a portfolio. Um, but by 2045, no fossil fuel left. Now, we may or may not reach that. People uh, aspire to that, they ideate to that. But, you know, I guess, I guess where I come out is um, if, if you're right, if we are still going to need fossil fuel going forward, if we really can't move it to 100% here or elsewhere um, on a regular, consistent basis, how does that affect the climate? I know people in Canada are, you know, thinking about this. Uh, you're environmental or more environmental than we are. But uh, how do you deal with climate change when you know there's a connection between fossil fuel and GHG, the greenhouse gas? Uh, you know, and, and sea level rise and all, it's all connected. Well, the so first, how, how do you deal with that? Well, the first thing you need to do is say, um, how can you use, instead of saying, let's absolutely not have any fossil fuels, is how can you use fossil fuels without ruining the environment? You know, and one of the well-established procedures is, uh, is sequestration. You, you can have a uh, power plant that produces greenhouse gases out of the smokestack, well, simply, you know, collect the greenhouse gases coming out of the smokestack and pump it back down into the reservoir that uh, the oil came from or whatever it was in into the first the earth, place. Let's say natural gas, yeah. yes. And the major oil companies, again, are leading the charge on how do you do this. There's a fantastic... Uh, program going on uh, where I think it's Shell Oil that's leading the way using one of the biggest platforms, these offshore mega platforms like the one the BP blew up in the Gulf, uh, well, they, about the biggest one that was in the North Sea, which are, you know, the most weather resistant ones ever built. And uh, Shell Oil is pumping um, CO2 through the pipelines and back into the reservoirs. Interesting. That have you been say used. pipelines. Yeah, the so under the pipeline underwater comes up, goes down again. Yeah, like when they did the oil in the North Sea, an awful lot of it. They had the big rigs, and then they built an undersea pipeline that went either to Norway or to northern Scotland. You know, from these huge fields, and that's the way the oil flowed. Well, now that the oil is gone from some of those fields... Mm, it does um, happen. It, well, this is underway now in a big scale. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Canada has several of these um, CO2 se sequestration uh, projects where they, you know, are in use and being used. But if you simply increase the scale of those, if you required them legally... Um, to do sequestration yeah. with, with every oil well... Well, not every every oil well or every field. I, I mean, if if the underground formation was good enough to hold the natural gas or the oil for you know thousands of years, you know certainly you know pumping the CO two back down, it's going to stay there and it isn't going is, to come is up. The, is there a negative side to that? I mean, is that going to have an environmental impact uh, when you pump it on down and put it in the same cavity again? It could. If you, again, it's much like the importance of regulation. Like, I think the United States is, is somewhere insane to be reducing regulations 
especially on the oil and gas industry yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, at, a, at this point in time is, yeah. is um, use a simple example. Um, you know, if you're pumping CO2 deep underground, you know, it's a liquid when it, with enough pressure and the heat for the, in depth. It, you know, it converts into a liquid form, so it's, uh, it's an awful lot smaller than, than in gas form, but nevertheless, it has a lot of pressure. So how much are you going to pump in there? Right. Well, you better not pump too much more than there used to be oil. So you have to do research, you have and to, you have to regulate it, and you have to monitor them. Well, you, so you, you research is kind of easy because the oil company would have stood in their head to research what was in that <laughs> well in the first, first place, place and right. what all the pressures were and did they need fracturing. And I mean, it's a fantastically sophisticated industry. I mean, Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. And, and certainly through you, I have come to know how sophisticated it is in, throughout Canada. But, you know, well, one thing, it, it strikes me that is that, um, you know, th it's a kind of an interesting analysis to say, look, we've got a lot of resources, and Canada is kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a learning experience for Americans to see how things work in Canada. And what I get is that we're gonna, we have a lot of fossil fuel left. We have a lot of technology that we have now and that will evolve. Uh, we have ways to control the amount of greenhouse gases that go up from standard uh, fossil fuel, uh, you know, mining. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, this does affect the view going forward. And I really wonder, with all of that, considering all of that, uh, where do you think we're going on this? Uh, is it that we will never, ever get to 100% renewable energy in this world? Uh, a lot of people, you know, really want that for a lot of reasons. Um, or is it that we will, uh, or is it that we will? Is it that at some point, you know, it's like the Karl Marx withering of the state. At some point, fossil fuels will wither, and we will be, <laughs> we will be able to use renewables for everything in the world with appropriate storage. So my question is, will that come? Will that happen? Do you see that on the horizon? The way you define renewables, leaving out nuclear, I'd leaving say out nuclear. not a chance. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, if you, you're using uh, hydro, hydropower, um, wind, solar, and geothermal, okay. um, you know, the answer is you won't make it. Um, now, remember that oil and gas is used for everything else, like the shirt I'm wearing and, you know, the belt I'm Furniture, wearing. Furniture, what have you. And, and your glasses, uh, the rim, and probably the glass yeah. in it. And uh, We forget you know, that sometimes. All kinds of things. Uh, Salad you know, dressing. Yeah, well... <laughs> I mean, if you if you take normal oil and you run it through a refinery, I mean, you can stick it on your sal on your green salad. It, it's not polluted, awful stuff. It's the other crap that's in it. It's, it's um, you know uh, where um, you know some of the dangers though on on global global warming relate to things that people don't count. You know, for example... Um, we only have a minute left. Okay, the, all the permafrost. If you're going to melt uh, the ice uh, in Antarctica, Greenland, Canada, and Russia, um, you're going you're to release uh, a ton of methane. And methane is probably uh, 15 times as much of a contributor to greenhouse gas like greenhouse gas simply warms the atmosphere yeah. and warms the ocean. So you're going to get all these ridiculous storms, like hot air creates, can Storm. hold more water. And therefore, so it's no wonder you're going to have more hurricanes and more ridiculous storms in the quantity of rain that hit Houston. So we have to be very careful about greenhouse gas and methane for that matter. Oh, you're past the point of... of Worrying, those storms are already there. Yeah, it, it's the the need to move is urgent. This um, U.S. billionaire push the, to have global warming deniers is total insanity as a society and and for the world. Yeah, well, let's leave it there. <laughs> Ken Rogers, hard Canadian businessman, live in the land of gas and oil in Western Canada. Uh, can tell us the perception there from Western Well, of course, Canada. an unbiased attitude. An unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken.
Great to have you on the show. Thanks, Jake. Uh, aloha.